Um, thank you all for joining me. Good morning. Happy Thursday um, for this really insightful conversation that I have planned. Um, I'm sure if you're here, uh, you have some familiarity with trauma-informed trauma approaches. And if you've been in this field for the last you know, three to five years, this is something that we're hearing more and more about, um, and it's becoming a norm. Um, and then there's some of the struggles or the challenges that we might have experienced um, being on the ground, being in schools, um, facilitating this work. Um, and I hope that this conversation finds you in a timely and relevant space um, in your organization, your school's uh, trauma-informed journey. Uh, and I look forward to your engagement throughout our time here. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started. As you already saw, um, just uh, uh, something to check in, uh, check the pulse of um, the room today. Uh, I don't know if this is the first or second session um, that you've been in, but I'd love to, to know how you're feeling today. And to do that, we have a jukebox of sorts um, that have different songs that describe our moods. And so I'd love for you to choose the song um, that depicts how you're feeling right now and put it in the chat box and Heather will um, share with us some of what she's seeing. So I, I see some Aretha, some Low Rider. Oh, I should have even given a description. So Low Rider is like our chill song, right? That we're just, you know, laid back, experiencing the day, not inclined highs or lows, um, just feeling good and content. Awesome, we got some lovely day. Feels good, awesome. I hope everyone, as you're reading these, the songs are playing in your head, because I know every time I look at them, that's how it goes for me as well. All right, we will move on. Um, so just a little bit about myself, um, so you know who, who you're talking to or who you're listening to. Um, I began my career in education as a classroom teacher in East Harlem in an elementary school. And from there, I returned back home to Los Angeles where I started working in school improvement um, in uh, comprehensive high schools and middle schools across um, LAUSD. And that was probably the first experience where I started to see that it wasn't just our students who are bringing a lot of trauma, who are um, experiencing you know, hardships and different type of um, challenging environments and learning spaces, but it was our adults as well. Um, and so in that space, I started to think more about what do trauma-informed spaces look like that leaders can cultivate for their educators to engage in this deep work, um, knowing that it's intrapersonal as well as interpersonal. Um, from that space, I moved into self-care, right? We don't wanna just stay necessarily in a space <clears throat> that's marked by trauma, but thinking about what's next um, and how we can put to use some of those positive and proactive coping strategies. Um, and I have found myself at West Ed where I do um, work with state education agencies, local education agency, agencies and schools um, on a number of topics, but mostly around um, social emotional learning, trauma informed approaches, as well as culturally responsive teaching um, and educator diversity. And so um, I at West Ed, I serve as key staff on um, the Center to Improve Social Emotional Learning and School Safety, um, and also a number of regional um, centers that support um, states in the New England area and then the Southeast. And that's a little bit about me. I'm curious who all is in the room here. Um, so I'm gonna invite you to please share your job title in the chat and um, note if you're a school-based uh, professional. Mm 
waiting for him to come through, sorry. No problem. So we have school counselor, site level support, school nurse, school-based health center clinician at a high school. Let's see what I'm missing here. School nurse, educational liaison for foster youth. Nice. Behavioral health, district level, um, program manager for Anthem, mm -hmm. manager, sorry. Admin assistant, another admin assistant. Uh, program director, director of school based health center, mental health coordinator. Health, Thanks, Heather. Uh, I think health. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, it sounds like all, you know, different, a variety of roles that are supporting either implementation of a team, um, perhaps you're supporting a leader, so perhaps you are supporting um, an initiative at a school site. And so I invite you as you engage with the content to think about, you know, how might you turnkey um, some of these strategies. Um, if things aren't clear for you, I invite you to put a question in the chat. Heather will send it to me and I can address that um, because I appreciate all of the role diversity that's here. And I think that there are, um, you know, kind of nuances in the application of, of what this might look like in your role and in your work. So I think we're all pretty um, Zoom, pretty much Zoom experts at this point. Um, but just as a refresher, um, here's a guide for you all. And um, kind of the setup that we have here is actually a little bit different because we have Heather as a moderator. So that's awesome. Um, one of the things that I wanted to um, check in with this group about is to learn a little bit more around your decision to attend this session. So why did you choose to, to join me um, this morning? And can you uh, type your responses in the chat, please? In the interest of time, Heather, I'm going to move on and then I'll pause and then we can kind of hear from folks. Okay. All right. Um, so here are our intended outcomes for our time. Um, the first being to deepen our understanding of some of the common roadblocks to trauma informed implementation and to discuss some of the proactive strategies that we can use to maximize the opportunities that are presented with a trauma informed approach. Um, we will talk about exploring the role of, well, we'll talk about the risk and protective factors that are related to trauma-informed approaches, and you will have some engagement and mindfulness strategies to add to your toolbox. Awesome. So I am seeing some of the responses. Uh, folks want to understand how to implement things. I really appreciate you um, sharing that one because a lot of times we don't pause and really think about implementing things in a thoughtful way. And for that reason, um, you know, there's no fidelity or, you know, we see some places that are spot on and then other gaps um, in our practices. So um, thanks for sharing that. Um, some folks are here who are promoting and implementing currently a trauma responsive approach, um, learning around trauma informed care, um, building on what you already know, looking for practical strategies. Great. This is, yes, trauma-informed is becoming more and more of a buzzword. I wanted to hear more about what folks thought about it and how they're operationalizing it. I want to learn about next steps and strategies. This is great. Thank you all for sharing. This is really good information. Um, throughout the session, feel free to put questions um, and ideas and thoughts into the chat. Heather will share them with me and as much as possible, I will weave them in or respond to them, um, you know, during our conversation. 
All right, so let's talk about the starting point. Why do we, why are we here? How did we get here? Um, and why is this a conversation that needs to happen now? Why is this an urgent conversation? So without even naming, and I just realized I didn't even put anything around the pandemic and the disparities in healthcare, the disparities in heck experience around um, you know, folks who are impacted as essential workers and families and communities um, where folks are parents and other family systems are losing their jobs. Um, those, those are definitely real um, and present needs. And we already are kind of dealing with a, a crumbling system that is largely trauma organized, right? And so if you look on the top right of this screen, you'll see this definition for trauma organized systems. It comes from the sanctuary model. Um, and it reads, when a, when a system becomes fundamentally and unconsciously organized around the impact of chronic and toxic stress, even when this undermines the essential mission of the system, right? So we think about, you know, how we look at school leaders or organizational leaders and they're constantly putting out fires, right? Constantly tending to crises. And we become so routine around that space that in, instead of, or in the absence of spending intentional time to think about proactive strategies, to think about, you know, um, strong implementation, we are, um, focus mostly around the chronic and toxic stress, right? So we're focused mostly around the problems and not necessarily where we want to be. And we know how that ends, right? That's the definition of insanity. And we have to pause and really be intentional um, to detangle ourselves and think thoughtfully around the, the way forward and really um, mobilizing the power of trauma-informed approaches. There is an increased focus on social emotional learning and well being. It's a merging body of work. We're learning more and more. Um, the truth is, I think we all um, understand the interconnectedness of our existence, of our, our beings, but now we see its space um, and place in schools and um, where children are experiencing explicit and implicit. Um, instruction and support around developing their SEL. And then in that space, what are the adult practices that we also need to cultivate to um, help students see um, what it looks like to be self aware to be a responsible decision maker. Um, and that is something that we can't uh, put off or put on the back burner any longer. Um, we have new understandings of trauma and how it impacts the brain and body. New understandings of trauma as it relates to race and community violence, right? These are things that we can arguably say have existed for a really long time. And now we have research and evidence of that existence that we can't ignore any longer. We're learning more about how teachers and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm coming from a school perspective, um, but I invite folks, like if there's particular questions you have around how this might look in your setting, feel free to um, put that in the chat as I've worked with healthcare um, organizations as well as nonprofits. But we see this um, focus on frontline providers. We're learning more about vicarious trauma. Again, not another topic that we can put off um, on the back burner. Attrition and turnover numbers. We see it, we see it among teachers, we see it among um, school leaders, we see it among other professionals, social workers, counselors, people who are um, serving the needs of our students and our families that are coming from really vulnerable situations. And we have to rearrange and restructure the ways our organizations are um, working internally to make sure that we're living the example that we want to bring into the world, right? So if our outcomes and goals of implementing a trauma-informed strategies are to have improved relationships, um, improved communication, it has to start inside. And I know that I'm talking, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but all of that kind of lays the foundation for why um, we have to engage in this conversation and also acknowledge what some of the roadblocks are um, that we might experience in implementing a trauma-informed approach. 
Um, one of the quotes I love to share is from uh, Dr. Miguel Cardona, and he is the commissioner of Connecticut. And he's say, he says, he states, um, public schools are the living rooms of our communities. And if we sit with that, what a powerful call to action that is, right? Because we all know what a living room feels like. And when we think about the centering and the bringing together that schools offer our communities, we can have that North Star, we can think more intentionally around who we are being and what we are doing to cultivate a safe and warm and inviting and welcoming space that is also culturally affirming um, to our students and to our families. So, you know, we talk a lot about definitions and terminology. I want to make sure that you know, as I use trauma-informed schools, or if we're thinking, you know, trauma-informed organizations, I'll allow you, or not allow, but I invite you to um, make adapt, adapt, adaptations as necessary. Um, but I want you to know what I'm talking about. So this is just an opportunity to build some shared understanding. So when I talk about trauma-informed schools, this is what I mean. A trauma-informed school acknowledges the prevalence of traumatic occurrences in students' lives and creates a flexible framework that provides universal supports, is sensitive to the unique needs of students, and is mindful of avoiding re-traumatization. I find that this definition is really comprehensive and very thorough to the multi-layered impact and kind of dimensions that we experience trauma in our schools and different ways that we can position support networks in the school to support what students and adults need. I understand that you know, many schools are at their different spots in their journey. And so you know, sometimes we are in places that don't have the resources for universal supports or hasn't really begun the work to start um, addressing re-traumatization without traumatizing the adults. So in this definition, I, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity um, and aspirations to think about what's next in your organization's kind of step of implementation. Um, so I offer this to everyone and it comes from the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Um, I just want to give like a, a minute to um, have folks maybe share in the chat like what phrase what phrase of this definition really like stands out or resonates for you. All right, Heather, I'm gonna go on in the interest of time, um, but we have the poll and so I'll um, check back uh, after we finish with the poll. Flexible, broad, sensitive, I feel like I need to. framework that provides universal supports, right? So there's an infrastructure around this approach. It's not just, we're going to teach it and everyone's going to do it, right? Um, all right, we're going to universal supports. It came up again, flexible, absolutely. Um, we're going to move on and we have a poll here that, Heather, will you launch our poll? Um, and this is just to give some data to me around where your school or organization is on its trauma-informed journey. Okay, can you all see the poll? I launched it. I'm hoping everyone's just thinking about it for a second. 
Okay, here they come. It's going back and forth. <laughs> Numbers are changing. Okay, right now we're at 75% early stages and 25% fully implemented. Um, it's kind of going back and forth around there, but it looks like early stages is def definitely um, the majority. Yeah, that sounds about right to what I've seen in the field. Um, so it's good to know uh, who's in the audience. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. All right. So what are some of the challenges and highlights that you've encountered with your trauma-informed implementation? And um, I'll invite folks to share. I realize that if you're at the early stages, chances are you know that you might have more challenges, but you might also have some highlights. Um, and just in the interest of time, um, I'll give maybe a minute for folks to jot down their responses in the chat box and then Heather will um, get those to me. But I'm kind of curious, um, what are some of the roadblocks that um, you all have hit in your implementation? Or that you're concerned about if you're at your early stages? So it looks like our poll uh, landed at 90-10, with 90 being early stages, 90%. Um, um, and one challenge is finding PD time to reach teachers, staff resistance, resistance. <laughs> They're starting to come in now. Teachers not thinking this topic applies to them. Overwhelmed with how big the issue is. including nurses and planning stages. Staff are busy and overwhelmed with current responsibilities and challenges in class. Mm -hmm. Staff overwhelmed by other burdens, not pr prioritizing trauma-informed care. Awesome, okay. Um, thank you, those are really helpful. And um, one thing that we can keep in mind is that none of these are definitive. And I hope that, you know, as we go through three of these common roadblocks, um, that there are strategies that you can use to kind of keep your head down and um, move forward um, that give people the tools and help them feel confident and efficacious about the work that they're gonna engage in. Um, and really kind of the reality that they're uh, taking a part in and shaping um, for your students and again, for themselves as adults. So let's go to opportunity number one. So I wanna be really uh, mindful of language and I know that I'm saying roadblocks, and I know that I'm saying challenges, but I want to switch gear on that, switch gears on that and really think about the opportunities that they are presenting to us. And one of the biggest challenges, ah, I said it. <laughs> One of the biggest um, learning opportunities or kind of ways to uh, respond to the challenge of folks not knowing what their role is, um, not understanding that we're not asking teachers to be um, school psychologists, mental um, health uh, you know, uh, specialists. We're not asking them to be nurses. We're not asking them to be private investigators or detectives and students personal lives. That is not what we want. But we all play a part in supporting the needs of our students, our families, and our school community as a whole. And we can achieve that with role clarity. And a lot of times when we see people uh, grasping and, you know, um, either, you know, coming from opposite extremes and how they embrace this work is because we haven't clearly named what the role is of that stakeholder or if, if it's the teacher. Um, so here are some different ways that we can start to map out the roles of um, the stakeholders. One is 
identifying what the larger strategy is. And it might be trauma-informed, you know, that our school is becoming trauma-informed. It might be that trauma-informed approaches fit inside of a multi-tiered system of supports. It might be that it fits inside of a referral system or that there are wraparound services um, or school-based health clinics that are at schools um, that are offering services. And so this is one um, strategy that can help students get the services that they need, help families get the services that they need. And so by being really clear on what the teachers and educators roles are, um, then you can help them see what they need to do because our end goal is that our students and our families are getting the supports that they need when they need them, right? So being very explicit about the expectations or the guidance. So what is your role here, right? I mean, I think it really depends on the audience and the folks that you are working with, but I would say it's not, um, it's not worth leaving it to chance, right? So the more explicit and direct that you can be inside of how, about how your trauma-informed approach fits inside of a larger strategy or is a strategy and what the roles are, um, the, the higher um, results that you can experience um, when we think about implementation and just folks feeling comfortable um, within this body of work. So, we also have here of like starting with the gradual stages of implementation, right? We're not going to just get the training and then be trauma-informed experts, right? We're not, we can't anticipate or expect that teachers are going to learn how trauma impacts the brain and then tomorrow they're going to have completely brain-based instruction, right? It is a process and the more clear we are on which steps of the process that we're on and what's ahead of us, then we can provide supports um, that can help them reach that, reach uh, those levels. Now, everyone is going to have varied levels of implementation, right? Like this is just something that we can anticipate. So thinking about like, what are the resources that you have? And then if for folks that um, need more, you know, how you would allocate that versus folks who um, are showing a little bit more competency in those spaces, right? What are the opportunities that you can have um, peer support um, in that for a high implementer and someone who needs some more work? You know, I also want to acknowledge that, you know, trauma is a sensitive topic. It's individual, it's developmental, um, and everyone has their own understanding of it. So I don't want to um, put on the table, you know, as if this is just, you know, like something that like content area that you can have some demonstrated expertise and success and then go teach someone else. Um, it is a sensitive space. And so um, it really is up for us as leaders, if you are an implementation team, to really think thoughtfully around what type of supports um, you have present, what you will still need, and given what those are, what the expectations can be and how you can be very clear about that. Um, providing space for staff to reflect, to integrate those changes, right? If it's, um, you know, five to 10 minutes in a um, PD and there's a strategy, a mindfulness strategy that you want to take them through. Um, if there is, you know, questions that you're asking to learn more about how the support you're providing is helping them feel more confident in their work. Um, there's kind of many points that you can pause and, and encourage and cultivate a reflective um, culture for them to see themselves in this work. Let's acknowledge also kind of another principle around trauma-informed approaches, and that is this work changes you, right? Like we come into this work and we are not the same people who first came in. We learn a lot about ourselves through supporting others and um, that takes, you know, different people grapple with that um, in, in different ways and for different amounts of time. Um, that being said, as a um, part of a whole inside of a school or inside of an organization, there's also a shared commitment to a collective space. And so when we think about um, the needs of our students, the needs of our families, 
we have to be attentive to those. Um, and so that is, it's a soft push and pull. And again, that's why spending time on the front end to think about, you know, your audience, the people that you're supporting and really mapping out supports that are specific to their role, um, that can support them as individuals will um, yield really great results um, and um, support for uh, the folks that are you know, tasked with implementing this. And there's a question around, is there criteria that needs to be met for a school to be certified as trauma-informed? Um, I want to say at a national level, there's not one uh, certification. Um, that deems a school trauma-informed. If someone is in the room and they have um, a different, you know, opinion or understanding, feel free to um, put that in the chat. I do know that there are um, other organizations that do provide certification, um, and I would imagine there's probably districts um, across the country who have almost started their own certification um, process, um, and then there are folks who I've talked to that, you know, really lean into the support from SAMHSA and the National um, Child Traumatic Stress Network to um, learn more about what needs to be in place and implementing, but I'm unaware, I don't believe that there is just, you know, like a national certification or kind of what we think of like, you know, blue ribbon schools or some of the other certifications um, that is specific to trauma-informed. Awesome. All right. Um, so here's uh, just a quick plug around spending time on implementation. This comes from NERN, um, and NERN is really the, at the forefront of implementation science. And so a lot of their work is thinking about that initial stage and what needs to be in place for things to be implemented well so that there is sustainability beyond the push, right, like that initial adrenaline. So. Here we see on the left screen, on the left side of our screen, you know, when there's no implementation team, it's like a letting it happen phase, right? And what happens is over time, it just dwindles and dwindles what the implementation looks like, probably the fidelity and really the success of that program. Whereas by having an implementation team and spending time really being intentional around getting started, building infrastructure, building a network, we see that folks go from letting it happen to making it happen. And um, the skills that, you know, we would acquire, you would acquire moving through um, methodology like implementation science could be used in different initiatives, not just, you know, for trauma-informed. All right. So let's talk for a second about communication. What we know is that the majority, and this is disputed, right? This is uh, science. So between 75% and 90% of our communication is nonverbal, right? Our body language, our emotional expressions, our facial gestures, right? All of these things are emitting messages. They're communicating something, right? And we see this a lot of times where people's energies don't match their message, right? Their energy is like, I'm over this, or I don't trust you. But then their message is, I'm so, I'm so excited, right? <laughs> and I get that folks have different affects, um, but we have to be aware of how we're showing up um, and what and how we're maximizing um, all of the potential that's wrapped up in our nonverbal language, just as much as our verbal language. And that um, being said, like this is kind of a segue um, between our last um, opportunity and the next one, um, that when we're thinking of the role clarity, that we're maximizing all of the opportunities and the ways of communicating um, to affirm uh, the baby steps or the beginning stages that our educators and different school staff, staff might be in as they engage in this work, um, knowing that it is personal um, as well as professional. And so some of their responses to being resistant, to um, being dismissive, 
um, might be some of their own inner conflict and really having clear strategies that we can both support them in, we can model for them um, that they can do um, while still grappling with some of like their own kind of critical challenges and dissonance. So let's talk a little bit about safety. Um, to open this part up, I would really like for you all to use the chat box and share what does safety look like, feel like, and sound like? And you're speaking for yourself. So to you, what does safety look like, feel like, and sound like? I invite you to think about also, right, that nonverbal verbal piece, right? So what does it feel like? Um, how do people make you feel comfortable or kind of create spaces that you feel safe in? Um, what does it sound like, obviously, and um, how does it look? Okay, I'm gonna read some off. Um, consistency, transparent, predictability, um, non-judgmental, the ability to talk openly about issues or struggles we may be facing without judgment, home, shelter, support, calm, able to perform work and do activities without fear of surroundings or others involved, uh, positive messaging. Great. Thank you. Those are all really um, great examples. And you know, it's interesting because like trauma, which is individual and developmental, so is safety, right? Safety is very personal um, and it looks and feels and sounds different for all of us. Um, here are some um, examples and I think a lot of these echo what you all shared. So feeling heard and valued across your identities, right? So, you know, sometimes um, in shared spaces, many times for people, who may not have, um, you know, an identity that's a dominant identity, a dominant culture. So thinking about racial, ethnic, linguistic diversity, um, that not all of your identities are affirmed and welcomed in shared spaces. Asking consent and honoring boundaries, right? What does that look like at, as an organization in, in meetings, in professional developments? Um, trust and follow through. I heard predictability. I heard routines. I heard structures, right? Those are all things that help us feel safe. We know what's going to be expected, right? That kind of goes back to that first um, opportunity around role clarity. Comfort with vulnerability, right? Like we need people that are going to model these pieces. You can't just tell me sternly and directly, like I have to be trauma informed and this is what trauma is and all of those things. You have to model humility. You have to model humanity. Um, having norms and shared agreements. Um, we're only meeting briefly today, but typically for something like this, we would set working agreements so that we all can stay in the room and support each other's you know, presence and best work um, and collaborate effectively. Communication, task management, um, commitment to being a learning organization. This is a big one um, that, you know, we're coming together to do something better. We're coming together to learn. So sure, we might have our expertise, but we are not an expert in all things and all people, right? So we're coming into this space knowing that there's going to be times we teach and times that we learn. And um, learning is going to change us. Learning is going to shift us. Um, and the more that we build a culture um, in that space, then the more um, folks can um, feel that they can be more adaptive, right? That they are not going to be as restrictive or um, rigid around um, what they're willing to do and not to do. So this brings us into our next opportunity, and that is around consistent culture and climate. 
again, I brought up the modeling. We can't demand something from our stakeholders and not provide them that same space, right? So how do we create cultures for adults that mirror what we want for children, right? We want our children to feel safe. We want our children to feel ready to learn and to um, have all of their needs met, to have healthy relationships, to make good decisions. Well, how do we create those conditions for adults? Um, and a lot of times, you know, we see um, trauma-informed approaches um, being uh, implemented or um, requested by schools that are in uh, a deep crisis. And it makes sense, right, that we want to resolve um, some of the needs that are coming in through our students. Well, how do we do that for our adults? Because if our adults are in a space where they don't trust each other, where they're not listening, um, what do we imagine happens in the classroom, right? Um, modeling and implementing strategies and structures that promote safety and well-being among the adults, right? So if we're noticing particular patterns of behavior um, between adults and students, then what does that tell us about what we need to do to support adults, to create those authentic learning experiences and opportunities for them um, in a safe space so then we can um, have them stretch or extend that learning into their classroom in, in their instruction. Um, cultivating protective factors and providing resources to mitigate risk factors, right? So we think about protective factors being resilience, um, having social support, of having high expectations, but then having resources to help you achieve them, right? How might we really um, use those as a North Star to think about, you know, what does social support look like in my organization? How do we make it um, healthier? How do we, you know, pair people up and, and help them feel um, more at ease with how they're contributing to professional learning, with how they're sharing what's on their mind, um, and that it's not just segmented on like a grade level team or, you know, these next door neighbors. Mitigating the risk factors, right? We all know, you know, different risk factors. We're in a pandemic, right? We're not um, physically connected in the same way. Um, a lot of times we are getting conflicting messages from, you know, using all of the technology from social media, um, from our own worries and fears and doubts. Um, from wanting to create safe spaces for our students and feeling limited, and then also, you know, cut, turning to um, our organizations and not feeling necessarily welcomed or supported. Um, and then, you know, this other, this last piece around starting small and monitoring progress before scaling, right? I think a lot of times we learn about a great strategy, we learn about, you know, a new content area, and we're like, you know, let it rip, let everyone implement fully. And we're not, again, being intentional around implementation and around what infrastructure and relationships need to be in place, both systemically or systematically and, um, uh, um, you know, person-based relationships, right? Um, and supports and resources and things like that. So I know that I've talked a lot and I'm gonna to continue to talk because that's the nature of what we're doing here. Um, but I'd love for folks to send in questions or um, type in any ahas that you're experiencing as we um, kind of move um, towards our, our last um, strategy and opportunity. So Erin, can I just um, make a request is that for some reason I'm getting notifications that there's a question in the Q&A um, piece, but then when I click on it, there's nothing there. So if you have asked a question or you have a question, if you could put it in chat, um, that way I can see it. I apologize. Um, then I can get them to air. Thanks. Thank you. And while those are coming in, um, I have a poll for you and then a definition around psychological safety. But this poll first, is how much do you feel safety is prioritized in your workplace? Um, so we have five as always and one as never.
Okay, so we're getting responses and um, fluctuating, of course, but we're right around 70 always and uh, 30 never. Nice. Nice kind of for work. 70. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of hovering between 80, 20, and 70, 30. This point. And then in the chat, we're getting um, two threes, a four, a five, another three. I'm really impressed by fives. That's very hopeful and promising um, because I have to say that's not my experience, um, you know, giving this poll that folks uh, feel always that their safety is prioritized. Yeah, we're at about uh, 75, 25, awesome. 75 always. And there are two fives, a four, two threes. Now there's a one, another five. All right, well, thank you, um, Heather. And then if the questions or comments are coming in, um, I'm just gonna keep going, but feel free to pause me for those. Um, or to put them in our chat and then I can respond. Um, so here's a definition from Amy Edmondson, who's done a lot of work on psychological safety. And this is her um, understanding of what it is. And that is psychological safety describes the perceptions or describes perceptions of the consequences of taking interpersonal risks in a particular context, such as workplace, team setting, or shared space. So that really should resonate um, with, you know, what we talked about earlier and thinking about those strategies um, that having structures, having, um, you know, kind of uh, having structures and conversations, um, also in grouping, um, roadmaps and timelines, that those are all pieces um, that can support us feeling um, safe and uh, ready to kind of engage um, in the trauma-informed um, work and kind of the demand that's ahead of us in that space. I'm gonna move on and get to opportunity number three. So it takes a village, right? And for folks that are kind of a little bit beyond that initial stage, um, I think this is really where the pedal hits the metal um, in the regard that Oftentimes, you know, trauma informed trauma is so individual. It is so um, developmental that um, our processes happen um, alone. You know, we we process alone, um, especially in the workplace. We may not feel comfortable talking to other people around what we're struggling with, um, what some of the challenges are, what our own personal experiences that come up um, from engaging in this learning together. And it may not be clear on how we're supposed to um, leverage the collective, how we're supposed to um, engage with our colleagues around embarking on this work. And we can't do it alone, right? We can't do it in isolation. Um, we need to be supported. We need to um, bring that support and that warmth um, to, into our classrooms to support our students, to help them create um, that village inside of their classroom. And that requires both the interpersonal and the intrapersonal, right? The intrapersonal being that processing, kind of navigating where you're at, checking in with yourself, being reflective, and doing that also in community, right? Not feeling um, that you have to be isolated or processed outside of, um, you know, uh, the professional development or other ways that you're engaging with people. I think maybe to the group, you know, this group that um, are attending this session, you know, this work is, is probably really close to you. And so there's ways that your organizations engage in these conversations with a lot less, you know, red tape or a lot less barriers that we might experience bringing this into our schools. And so, you know, questioning assumptions, questioning the barriers, like what are some of the challenges and roadblocks, anticipating those, um, and then providing some type of like collective support. This is not on the shoulders of one person. We do 
do not want a secondary teacher who has 160 students to be a trauma expert to diagnose, you know, things that may not even be their students experiences in terms of trauma. We want to be clear with them around their roles and let them know that there's a whole mass of other people that are here to support as you know, that's accurate. So if you do have um, a team of mental health uh, providers at your school site, or you do have a, a school-based mental health clinic, that they know um, where those folks are and that there's some kind of constant communication or consistent communication that's happening, um, that they don't feel that they're alone. Um, isolation and exclusion will not help to achieve the intended outcomes, right? Like this is not something that we can just have that training and you know put out an implicit expectation that student that teachers are supposed to have trauma-informed instruction and trauma-informed classroom management plans um, without providing them uh, that support and um, focusing on how to bring people in right like we don't not want to use a strategy as important as trauma-informed to say you're in and you're not right to, to exclude people based on our own perceptions of what they can and can't engage with. Um, so what are some of the opportunities for us to learn how to um, call people in, to learn how to build shared accountability? Um, because again, we're doing this um, in the interest of you know, our students, our families, and ourselves. We don't wanna harm ourselves in the process. And if someone's being harmful, then that's a conversation that needs to happen. But Again, it all comes back to the clarity um, that we started out with around what everyone's um, work is supposed to look like. One way that you can um, support people in identifying their blind spots is talking more about identity, right? So, you know, here we have this example of the iceberg. I'm sure many of us have seen this metaphor of, you know, on, on top of the surface, these are the things we see. We see people's actions, we see their behaviors, we hear their words, we see their decisions. And then underneath are all these other deep structures that are influencing how they're showing up. So giving people time to explore what those are, helping them interrogate their own biases, helping them understand what are some of their own barriers, and then offering that to the group so that all of us can be supportive. All of us can be proactive in helping name maybe some solutions or ways of resolving or working through and with um, that, that um, blind spot. All right, so I have a question for you and this is connected with our identity, but when was the last time you either faked or hid an emotion at work? Let's talk about that. Actually, that's probably not the best. So we only have about five minutes left. Um, let me move us along. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on that interpersonal piece, building the strategies from It Takes a Village, just really maximizing learning and understanding about interpersonal relationships, knowing um, that it's critical to our social emotional learning. Um, a lot of the districts and states that we're working with right now are exploring how do we support adults building their social and emotional co uh, competencies and being in community with each other. And so here is the will that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Um, and interpersonal skills are the crux or the core of our work as educators and school-based um, professionals, right? We're constantly negotiating and brokering and working and communicating um, with our colleagues, our students, our families, and how we show up and how consistent that is, is really um, determined by the quality of the relationships. And again, being inclusive versus exclusive. Um, so if there's more questions, especially on this piece, as we kind of move a little bit more rapidly, feel free um, to reach out to me. I'll have my um, email on uh, the last slide. Um, here is uh, a strategy for proactive coping. Um, we talked about anticipating roadblocks. 
Well, one strategy um, that we can match with that is being proactive around, you know, what the needs might be. If we're thinking of a particular student who has a really hard time on Monday mornings or Friday afternoons, what are some of the things that we can have in our back pocket to respond to that child instead of being reactive in the moment? Right, proactive coping, and for adults, right? If you are a leader and you're um, meeting with a group of adults and there's some patterns and things that you see, how might you be proactive um, in supporting their needs and mitigating some of the stress um, that you experience? Um, so I wanted to share uh, um, some upcoming work in the field. Um, there's a lot being done around pro-social school leadership, pro-social um, professionals, and um, Greenberg is one of the authors of the CASEL framework. And I really look forward to this um, becoming more of a norm in the field because what we're seeing is that leader well-being is one of the number one determinants of organizational well-being. And when we think about leading these initiatives, even as a leadership team, like being really intentional around um, the modeling, around the language, around the clarity. Um, I appreciate that I'm being repetitive because I think it really helps to land kind of how some of those simple building blocks can really be the make or break for your um, trauma-informed strategy and that when we skip past them, um, that's when we see some, um, some really big gaps um, through the implementation. Here's some next steps. Um, some of the things that you might see um, from West Ed, I mentioned the Center for um, Social Emotional Learning and School Safety uh, for improvement of those. Um, there are a number of briefs that are being published that have been published around social emotional competencies, staff wellness, uh, community care. Um, there's professional development, um, tips and guidance for school leaders and principal supervisors and continuous improvement cycles. Um, these are all kind of different um, pieces that have a relationship or a connection to um, trauma-informed supports. And with that, I wanted to give us an opportunity for um, some closing thoughts. And so here I have some phrases that I would love for um, folks to choose and um, fill in the blank. Uh, and put in the chat box and we'll have Heather close us out um, sharing some of those. And I'll read them since they're on the screen. Um, so blank resonated with me most. Um, the next one is I am leaving here with blank. The next is I commit to blank. And then the last is I appreciated blank. Uh, so we have respond, not react. Nice. Someone said the amazing, the presentation was amazing. Thank you. And just so you know, it won't cut you off if you're, if we go a little long. Okay. <laughs> they, tend, Thank you. they tend to come in all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone um, for folks that are hopping off. Thank you for joining me this morning and um, this is my information, my email, um, and my phone number, but just email me is probably better than trying to reach me by phone. Um, thank you very much for coming. And someone's asking if you can please show the last slide. Um, I appreciate that other folks are focusing on culture and climate with trauma-informed care at a school-wide level. Our students deserve it. Absolutely. I appreciated seeing everyone's responses throughout the session as it validated my own experiences with trauma-informed work. Mirroring the culture and climate we want for children. More compliments on the presentation. All right, Heather. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, everyone's thoughts and thank you all again um, for attending. And I look forward to hearing from folks that might have questions um, or requests for um, resources. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
I commit to not giving up and creating a better school culture.